Take Welcome it. to Phoenix Hill's Live Phoenix Hill Library semi-annual open mic night. My name is Evan Harpel and I will be hosting a little bit about me. I'm a mental therapist by profession, but I write in my spare time. I generally write across genres. I'm also a trained researcher for social sciences and received an award for research as an undergrad. I'm also the leader of the Phoenixville Fiction Writers Group, which meets here at the library on every first and third Tuesday at 7 p.m. Um, actually, gets out the details. No, currently we're still meeting on Zoom. On Zoom. Um, yeah. So please give me an, um, uh, an email. My email's on the library website. Um, we, we critique each other's pieces. That's the primary function of the group. Um, Okay, the way things are going to work tonight is I'm going to draw your name. I'm going to draw your name out of the box. Then I'm going to read your bio. Then you're going to come up and read your piece for a maximum length of five minutes. Um, and then you'll read your piece, and then we'll continue with the next person, etc. Um, so. So please be respectful of other people's time as well. Uh, and stories can be a complete story or an excerpt from something larger, which I'm sure. Okay, oh, and a reminder to silence your cell phones if you have one. Okay, I'm gonna start with my reading. Um, this is part of a large, short, long short story called Blood in the Nile. Um, this is chapter one, Down the River Nile. Dolores's cruise down the Nile River was far more relaxing than she had expected. Her fellow professor strolled along the deck as she tanned in the unrelenting and warm Egyptian sun. At first, when Dolores had heard about the idea of having a symposium on a boat, she laughed because it sounded absurd. But as it turned out, the cruise so far had relaxed her body and stimulated her mind. There were academic debates that went on for hours, great food, lots of sun, gorgeous vistas, and of course, free-flowing wine. Lake Nasser said the first, oh no. Nearby, a pair of men were talking loud enough to for her to hear, but not loud enough to annoy her calm too much. Lake Nasser, the first man said, if there is a tomb beneath it, why is it so far from any other settlements, and why is it entirely undocumented? According to my anthropology friend here, the other man responded, because it's the tomb of the wealthiest pharaoh of the new kingdom. The creation of the Aswan Dam flooded the site, but most likely not the tomb itself. Well, said the third man, if it's under the lake, we'll find it. If not, we can check that off as possible site and look elsewhere. At this, Dolores removed her sunglasses and squinted her eyes, not because of the sun or what was said, but because of the voice expressing it. Mateu, he turned and looked at Dolores and then smiled. Dolores Corazon, of all the gingerwits in all the academic world, she got up from the sun chair and moved to hug Mateo. I didn't realize that you were aboard. Well, he said, I... Well, he said, I... Or that you were interested in Egyptology at all, for that matter, she continued. I knew that was coming, Mateo released the embrace. Anthropology's four subfields are inherently interrelated. Culture, history, and biology all in fact language. Whatever you tell, have to tell yourself to sleep at night, she said. What are you really doing here? I'm translating a dig. I'm taking this ship to Aswan. And there is no, ar no archaeological sites in Aswan. This is a pleasure cruise. I'm taking this ship to Aswan, and then we're going to dredge Lake Nasser. What part of Lake Nasser, she asked. Mateo opened his mouth to answer, but the man next to him responded instead, the entire lake, all the way up to a Busan bell. Dolores looked at the gorgeous, well-muscled man with dark curls of thick hair. I'm sorry, I haven't had the Omar Il Ibrahim, Dr. Corazon. He offered his hand, and she shook it, both of them holding on 
the other for a little longer than is normal. She noticed a large gold ring with a signet symbol she didn't recognize. And what is your capacity on this exposition, Mr. El Ibrahim? First Lieutenant, ma'am, Omar said, to the Egyptian National Police, I'm here to make sure Mr. Pensier doesn't run into any administrative roadblocks. Mateo turned to the man on the other side of him and meet Dr. Yusef Call, a friend and skeptic who happened to join us on this excursion. Dolores shook Call's hand as well. What do you expect to find? Mateo gave her a smug look. Nothing more than the lost tomb of Ramses VIII, the grandson of the wealthiest pharaoh to ever live. Dolores nodded with one eye on Omar. Care for a little help? <coughs> Late that night, Dolores was walking back to her cabin from the dining room, where she had heard, where she heard a hasty and pressured conversation in Arabic, whispered at the base of the stairs. Dolores cautiously followed the sound of the exchange, but it was over before she could effectively eavesdrop. A man with a large gold signet ring came through this star stairwell door, not seeing Dolores with her back against the hinges, and walked along the deck, away from Dolores, who remained unseen. Dolores could have barely hear the footfalls on the stairs to the upper cabins. She tactfully waited a few moments before continuing on her way. Opening the door to her quarters, Dolores realized reason that this journey would be more than a simple excavation. She chained the lock to her door and just hoped the drama would be kept at a minimum. Teresa Werber? Werber, yeah. Werber. Okay. Teresa Werber, formerly Teresa Rodriguez, is the author of three books of poetry, most recently sonnets, a collection of 65 sonnets, her work has appeared in such journals as the Scarlet Leaf Review, the Wilderness House Literary Review, Spindraft Mezzo Camin, The Wombwell Rainbow, Fevers of the Mind, Serotonin, The Road Not Taken, and the Society of Classical Poets Journal. Her work ranges from forms such as the Ode and the Sonnet to free verse, with topics ranging from neurodivergence, the writing process, love, loss, and aging, to faith and disillusionment. Our website is www.bardsinger.com, where you can view videos of her performance poetry and find information about her books. Follow Teresa on Instagram and Twitter at the Sonic Queen. Everyone, join me in welcoming Teresa. I was going to be called first for some reason. Am I supposed to speak into it? You can yet lower that. I have to lower it. I'm yep. so short. I'd like to start. Uh, I, I was going to read from my other book, but I thought I'd stick to this one, my sonnets, for the evening. The first one is uh, my happiness of being able to create and create poetry particularly. The word birth, sonnet. I gave birth to a poem the other day. I labored for 12 hours in a rhyme. I centered, conjured, wound, throbbed, then gave way to empty out the fullness of my time. As in the waves and ebbs and flows of life, my blood and pulsing, bearing down its course, I think I gestate, for the pangs of strife are sperm to my ripe, beating, ovoid source. Oh, I'm aching. So intense are all the squeezings and the earnest tides of pain. I move about, then settle in 
to call with open heart my brain canal again. For writing is the labor of the mind, and I have birthed my children all in kind. The second I'm sure that you will all uh, relate to, it is entitled Writer's Block. I feel like I am plodding through cement. My mind is full of cotton batting, dull and dense and empty-headed, thinking spent on trying to find clarity to mull about within and come up vacant. Try I might, but efforts are in vain. My words seem plastic or ephemeral, trite, dry, no meaning, or I've lost them. All this girds my faculties to action, but to naught. I wish I could say what has not been said before, but I come up again, distraught about the product from a deadened head. Oh, would that something fresh would come to me, not what amounts to sheer banality. In a more uh, philosophical mode, I have a when I hear. Oh, when I hear the plaintive, painful sound of music played within a minor key, or modal scales in doleful reverie, suspensions and its dissonance abound. A juxtaposing light and dark around a center of discordant harmony combined with the most weeping melody is where a truth so sacred may be found. For it is in the ebbing resolution when tensions ease and struggling is at rest that one can find a consonant conclusion and peace from pain residing in the breast. For suffering can be a benefit if acquiescing music's made through it. My last of the evening here is the rise of Fall, which is one of my several of my commentaries on the aging process, which I'm sure many of us relate to. There were such pretty flowers in the spring, the fragrant colors of a verdant time, such fresh potentiality, sublime in all the loveliness that they did bring. Then summer issued forth a deep wellspring, maturely ripening, where vines would climb and trees begin to bulge. This is the prime of life, when life, when of life, when growth will dance and sway and sing. But autumn, is the time of now. I stand amid the harvests and the fruit. The change between the then and now, it leaves me jaded. I barely have the bearings to withstand this person of today. Indeed, how strange, how much the beauty of the past has Thank you, Mark. Next speaker will be our next speaker will be Dan Urban.
Ann Erdman is a geologist, geologist and licensed site remediation professional. He's the principal of an environmental consulting firm he founded 18 years ago. When not writing technical documents, he writes poetry, an activity he dabbled in for, the, for, in for several decades. He is presently organizing his collection for the publication of two, maybe three books. He has, pub has been published in a few of Katie Comer's Affinity Collab issues and is an active participant in the Meeting House Writers Group. Dan frequently reads at the monthly Steel City Open Mic in Gang. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dan. Kevin. Hey Luke. Hello everybody. Um, I have four pieces I'm going to read tonight. I did not have a theme I thought when I pulled them together but as I went through them I said all of these are talking about communications between some people. And the first one is probably one of my newest ones called Meat and Potatoes. He said I'm going to the supermarket to buy slaughtered farm animal parts on a styrofoam plate wrapped in plastic razor blades, and lime-scented shaving cream. I like the smell, and I want to clean up a bit before Bob and Susan come over for dinner. Is there anything else we need? She said, no, I'll be out back in the garden. It's time to harvest some potatoes. I like to feel the earth on my hands and how the smells of tomato plants, dill and parsley, linger on my skin and clothes when I'm done picking. But then she thought as he left, a gravy to go with the meat and potatoes would be nice. I don't really know those two people, but I think we all know people like that. Um, I do know the two people in this next one. One of them is me, and the other one is my brother-in-law. Now, my brother-in-law is, I'm from New York, he's from New York. My brother-in-law is about 300 pounds of, of solid Italian construction worker. And our conversations are usually banter back and forth, if not downright arguments. I've never spoken about politics with him since the Clinton era. I never talk about the Mets and the Phillies. <laughs> I never have a conversation with him anymore about what really goes into spaghetti sauce, because I put a little barbecue sauce in there, and that's, that breaks the rules. Uh, but I did have a conversation with him about recycling stuff, and the title of this one is A Conversation with My Brother-in-Law, Ray, About Recycling Stuff. Yeah, that's right, Ray, I'm com composting my toenail clippings. <laughs> putting them right here in his canister on a kitchen countertop with the tomato stems, zucchini skin, eggshells, and coffee grinds. And if you're not asking me a rhetorical question, I'll answer it, Ray. No, I am not out of my organic loving mind. But Ray, if you truly believe toenail composting to be odd, let me tell you about the robins in my backyard. They build their nests with trimmings from my beard. Yeah, I thought you'd tell me that was really friggin' weird, Ray. Hey, Ray, when you done eating that apple? And while I'm still standing here at the composter canister, would you mind passing me the core? You know that apple wouldn't be so big and juicy if I myself had not fertilized a tree with some good old manure. No, Ray, I'm talking about cow manure. <laughs> Why? It's because I love the earth, Ray. And I love you too, man. And, and I love my crops. And I would even recycle my body parts to you if mine were the first of our lives to stop. Yes, Ray, you can have my liver if I were to suddenly die. I'd give you my heart, skin, kidneys, a lung, or an eye. Anything you may want or need from my post-mortem dissection. No, Ray, 
I won't bequeath you my penis if yours could no longer get an erection. I'll donate that organ to some other poor and potent mister. Let's be serious about this, Ray. You are, after all, married to my sister. So let's just talk about these toenail clippings. These cutaneous tips are rich in protein keratin. It's a good thing to put them back in the ecosystem, Ray. They decompose and replenish the soil with carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen. There's a deficit of these elements in many natural environmental settings. And this is why I spread my toenail clippings in a garden and on the lawn. Yes, like you, Ray, I used to send them to a landfill in the trash. But now I know that it's just so, so wrong. This organic matter that I just clipped from my toes has been re recycled in nature many times before. Maybe once, my toenails were cartilage in a woolly mammoth's nose. Maybe the eggshell of an osprey or a goose. Who are we, after all, to deny our fellow creatures of such beneficial reuse? So tell me, Ray, if you can, what exactly is your issue with me recycling my carinitized tissue? <laughs> It's nice to be here, even though you know, there's still a lot of us wearing masks. And I'm thinking back to the early days of, of uh, you know, the COVID and going into a, a grocery store and being freaked out. And was, you know, at least send one of us to the grocery store at any one time. And uh, this was before we had inoculations and we knew that we couldn't get it from touching cans and, and all that stuff and, and uh, it was it, this was a song about paranoia kind of and that's the title of this one is that's your five minute uh, warning it is yeah okay we'll make this the last one then. okay it's called rattlesnake in a grocery aisle behind a covid mask news on the radio as i pulled into the grocery store parking lot the rats are eating their own in new york city Empty dumpsters behind the closed restaurants in Chinatown. Scrap scarce. The pack from Canal Street crawled into the nest on Mott, and the mother with the new litter knew their hungry eyes and exactly why they were there. Most of the em empty shelves in the store, and I was thinking of a time ago along a deserted t West Texas roadway, just me and the vulture in the windshield. Nobody won. Belly full of roadkill. Wet heavy wings in the rain, delayed takeoff in a bad tra trajectory, I guess. Kablam, damn, cracked glass, feathers and blood. All these warm-blooded animals turned cold like, like, like the rattlesnake in the grocery aisle, moving toward the last jar of marinara sauce on a shelf, chanting the obvious motto behind my mask as a maskless, maskless one rushes in fast and reaches. What's wrong with you? so close that I can feel your death breath on my coiled hand. Can't you hear the rattle behind my mask? Go ahead, take the last jar, it's cracked anyway. And I'm not sure which side of the windshield I'm on today as I sidewind down the aisle toward frozen pizza. Reader will be Jim Sassman. Sassman. James F. Sassman is a novelist writing literary fiction. He is also a defense litigator before the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. His current work in progress is called Dempsey's Diner. Framed by Watergate, this novel chronicles the end of the hippie era in a small town, nocturnal, underground, underworld setting. Please join me in welcoming Jim. All right, time is a factor. This scene calls for no introduction. The scene is called Sissy Bomb. On our way into the diner, we hear a dame's voice coming from the wooden fence. Hey, lover. 
we turn to see who else with Polly, who adds, hi, Slim. What's happening, Polly? Is that the best you could do, Spitgo asks as we walk up the diner steps. Then he turns to me and says as he opens the door, why don't you cut that chick a break? Once inside the vestibule, I answer with, we've been through this before. As we take a booth on the York Street side, Spitgo says, I know, I know, Colleen Burns, now do you really think Colleen Burns is thinking about you right now? I don't know what she's thinking. All I know is I think about her all the time, and yet, I'm so sometimes I think about her never thinking about me. Now I'm thinking, but I ain't saying to Spitgo that he does have a good point about Pauly, uh, Colleen. He's right about Polly, too. Sometimes he just can't help but get things right. The last thing I need is Colleen hearing that I'm cavorting with the one and only Potts Hill Polly. I'm not in the wenching business, but there's a way to cut my girl Polly a break without violating the rules of courtly love. So now for me, it's exit stage left. I'll be right back, tell Edie I'll have an H2 and a coffee. Outside again, I call over to Polly and she comes a running. Then I place my arm on her shoulder, pull her toward me, and place my mouth very close to her ear. Then I sing to her, sotto voce. After only the first three notes, she turns to face me with a look of total surprise. But I don't let this interfere with my phrasing, and I go right back to her ear with six more notes. When I finish the first bar, I remove my arm from her shoulder and place my fingertips under her chin and ask her, in your entire lifetime, has any other dude ever done what I just did? <laughs> Polly just shakes her head no. I didn't think so, I tell her as I head back into the diner. Spitgo couldn't miss a second of this from behind Dempsey's booth window, but since he was inside, he could hear absolutely nothing. What was that all about? He told me to cut the chick a break. Don't tell me you were singing to her. Why not? I knew it. What'd you sing? Sissy Ball. The hell's that? French song. Don't tell me you sang to her in French. Yeah. French song. Has to be sung in French. Against the law not to. Now, does that qualify for cutting the chicken break? Can't argue with that, man. She probably never had that one before. First time for me, too. How can that be? You always told me you've been singing the chicks since you were five years old. That's true. But I never sang them a bonafide whore before. Okay, what about your Hyatt's chick? What about Colleen? Every chance I could get. What'd you sing? Ceci Bon. Gets them every time. <laughs> Our next reader is going to be Sandra Williams. Andrew Williams has taught language arts, world literature, and poetry at the high school and university levels. She writes essays and poetry and has self-published two books, Moss on Stone, a historical novella, and Time and Tide, a collection of tales and writes book, and writes book reviews for Meta Psychology Online. She is a longtime member of the Kimberton Meeting House Writers Group. Join me in welcoming Sandra. of uh, Christ and Buddha looking at each other and I thought they were brothers brothers in spirit in the Judean desert under the Bodhi tree left us simple lessons we pick and choose which ones to ignore because they are hard to live 
because we fear the other, because we shun the least of our brothers, because we judge harshly, because we forget why we came to this veil of tears, because we live on the horizontal, spirits in the material world, because we ignore the vertical, reaching to eternity, we captives see only a castle of wonders. Look to the point where the two directions cross, the middle way. We do not guess that the blood of one brother transubstantiated the earth into sacred ground. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. That the elder brother touched the ground, revealed the path of Dharma. Both bore witness, both taught the way to distill dross into gold. The lotus has eight petals. The lotus has a thousand petals. I think somebody spoke about transition into aging. So I've been thinking a lot about that and writing about myself. Not to be egotistical, but just to re be reflective. This one is called Simples. Of myself I write, what else do I know? Less and less the further I do go. Falling fast away the past and fading round on round. Save memory of love and loss abound. The dances of my spirit merge and wake and dream sublime, told only in this simple rhyme. Devoid of weighty verse, writ to exalted height, no alchemy of words can shed a light. Nor in paper will the gold of life be bound, but in hearts penetralium can be found. And in thoughts and words and deeds along the way, passed on to friend as well as foe, I pray. So here are these simple lines, our witness and a prayer, that what I've wrought and written, not for fame, is made of air. And when I lie beneath a sycamore, its torturous branches, beauteous forms, luminous and bare, against the sky will speak for me the why. Uh, okay. And another one about reflection on aging or just a transition to to another stage. This one is vintage, it's my last one. Now a time, with little of it left, I gather gently to my breast all my life crammed into given space, not to sort as pictures in a box into tidy stacks by time and place but as harvest do they come, their random fruits to trace, remembrances to keep, what I sowed, what I reaped, how and whom I loved, when and where, what was given me to bear, what was taken, what received, of all I once too easily believed. Amazed it seemed I thought I knew, in all directions I could choose, was but a labyrinth I wandered through, along its universal way of hope and fear, leading to the center, now and here. I reminisce with gratitude and joy and pain, at times mythologizing all that's been, or seeing clearly parts I played in life's grand drama, self or heaven made. Next reader will be Neela, Neela Kuhn. Neela Kuhn graduated from Tyler School of Art. She lives in Chester County where she has a studio. She is a visual artist who writes poems. She is a member of Meeting House Writers where they share their work and get support from other writers. Please welcome me, welcome me in joining Neela. Hi, 
Hi everyone. Nice to be here. I have um, three pieces to read. This one is morning. Each morning I stand facing the mirror, brushing wet hair away from sleepy eyes, forcing hot air to do its magic, warm my thoughts and nudge the cobwebs out. My hair flies up and away, most still tethered at the root. I can see in the mirror shadows splayed on the wall behind, shadows dancing, leaves swaying, light sparkling, here, now, with me, then gone, leaving the wall colored quiet in the mirror and my mind. <coughs> this is winter light. Breathing soundly, dog sleeps. Early morning sunlight spills across the bed. Heat rising up and over the window blinds slowly rocks a shadow, a lullaby softly swaying. Suminagashi lines flow forward, then back. Flow forward, then back as they ripple the surface of dog's legs. His eye twitches in sleep. A small sigh escapes as he dreams. Sunlight splash shadow blankets him in cold winter light. Reflection of water, reflection of sound. Seen in a mirror, my thoughts bounce back as I look ahead. I see my world behind. Reflection of wandering cloud caught on the wind. Outside a wide window, I swim my hand through undulating current. My rhythmic strokes slice sky. Up and up and down, slipping and skimming. I close my eyes within the cool dark. Music floats, images of color and sound, reflection of rushing quiet. Thank you. next reader is going to be Kaz. C.K. Sobe, also named Kaz, continues to live a life of curiosity. In her earlier years, she studied singing and theater. Kaz has, is, trained as, is a trained mediator and worked in in the San Diego Dispute Resolution Department, as well as the local real estate board of mediation. She worked in the corporate world for almost 30 years. Practicing as a spiritual practitioner, she later became a certified hypnotherapist, bringing a deeper understanding of the inner mind to others. Gas has since retired from her businesses to spend more time reimagining her life while writing and creating. Kaz will read some short pieces from her published book, Musings, Wool Gathering and Ghosts, and her soon-to-be-released book, A Collection of Tiny Stories, Diminutive Tales from the Tip of My Imagination. Join me in welcoming Kaz. under the name of C.K. and my friends call me Cass. Alchemy. 
I'm glad it didn't go as I had planned. A little easier would have been nicer, but then I wouldn't have found that my heart could go so deep, stretch so wide, though I found I was strong and resilient, and through the pain, I found another love, me. What would have happened if everything had worked out the way I planned? I don't know. It didn't. The dancer. She hides from life. She thinks of herself in the second person. This is always a successful place to not be noticed. She's safe then. Music is one way to express what's hiding. When she moves her body into a dance, it becomes a rhapsody for all who witness. It is then she opens up, receives the gifts. She allows herself to set free all that hides in the cave of her soul. It's then she shares her story. She hides nothing. It is magnificent. And the last one or two is from the new book that's coming out. The Janitor. Leon Jimenez, the janitor, went in for another night session of sweeping, dusting, emptying the garbage, and praying. Leon had been doing his work for 35 years. He'd driven far to clean many places. Ten years ago, he realized this was all there was to his life to work in this school, to be in school where the children screamed, fought, and had little respect for the old halls, the stories these halls could tell. He once had dreams of becoming a famous band leader, of going on the stage, when his wife told him that nothing else would happen, that this was their life, he became angry. Leon had never felt like an angry man. It was a feeling he didn't like. He was a man of the heart, a man of God, honest in everything he did. He told God about everything, and he thanked God for everything, especially for his wife. She was a good woman. One day, he took his wife on a walk through a neighborhood park. It was a lovely spring day. And he told her he was sorry he didn't make his dream come true, that he was just a janitor. She stopped walking and took Leon in her arms. She whispered to him that her dream had come true. It came true every morning she heard him come home and lie beside her, every night when he left for work. You are the best janitor in the world, mi amor. I could not be prouder of who I am married to, she spoke in a soft voice. When you used to sing to me and play your soft guitar, I was in heaven. I miss those times. Leon stepped livelier in the coming days. He had found his dream. Leon played his guitar again. He was a rich man indeed. The Sheriff of Iron Bark. I heard the chattering, shucking, and tisking. I knew the guardian of my yard was on high alert. By then I regarded the squirrel as the sheriff. Mm -hmm. A big gray and white cat sat under a leafless tree in my backyard. Even though the leaves were gone, the cat must have felt cloaked, under cover. The tabby just sat and waited. The sheriff as big and fluffy as the cat, chattered on in raucous sounds that built to an incredible volume. I believe the squirrel was alerting a family of chipmunks to be wary. The chipmunk family, you see, had lived and birthed under my patio. The cat is here, the sheriff screamed in distinctive tones. I shooed the cat away, telling it to go home, cursing the owners of the cat. I returned to what I was doing. 
Later that afternoon, I heard another sound. The sound drew me once again to look. I saw fallen leaves swirling in my backyard. Play was in full force. The squirrel was chasing a friend around, and they were playing tag. Smaller than the sheriff, the chipmunks were bathing in the warming sun. They had their babies. They were so tiny. I watched them peek around at this new world of theirs. All was well with the world. The sheriff was on the job. He's a late late entry. Okay. He's got to introduce himself. I know. Please it. welcome Greg. <laughs> Mark says I have to give my own bios. If you don't already know, um, I uh, for 20 years I taught writing at the middle school here in Phoenixville before throwing in the towel back in 2020. All right, I'm ready. No, no, I'm ready. No. Yeah, that's it. That's all there is. Okay. <laughs> um, upon announcing my retirement plans more than two years ago, some of my former students at the high school floated the idea of my speaking at the commencement ceremony that June. I thought, why not? I was never one to turn down an opportunity to rant to a captive audience. Right? But rather than spewing a lit litany of motivational cliches to a generation that would uh, like most likely be texting throughout my entire speech. My plan was to offer a list of practical applications designed to help them navigate the treacherous road ahead. Sort of a top ten list of do's and don'ts. But almost immediately after I began banging out my first draft, the entire world shut down and it became apparent there would be no graduation commencement that year. I was thus forced to banish my draft to a folder in the corner of my MacBook screen titled In Progress. Right? Not willing to waste a lifetime's worth of wisdom, I resurrected my list for tonight's presentation <laughs> with just a few res uh, uh, revisions more befitting an adult audience. Okay? So no particular order of importance. Uh, here's my top 10 or 12 lists for surviving to a ripe old age. Number one, your parents and teachers may have told you otherwise, but flattery really does get you everywhere. <laughs> Whenever you are called into your boss's office, even before he can chew you out for your latest screw up, make a point of complimenting his tie or his beautiful family in the framed picture on his desk. But never lie. Flattery should always contain the healthy element of truth. It helps if your boss really is a snazzy dresser and you often fantasize about making life love to his wife again. Um, whatever the situation, always be prepared. Uh, arm yourself with an array of compliments such as, damn Steve, have you been working out? Or say what girl, you don't look old enough to have a 27 year old daughter. Number two, throughout your life you will meet many poor excuses for human beings who are wasting good air that the rest of us could be breathing. <laughs> These are the same pond scum who will contribute most to your body of acquired wisdom. For they will take you to the bottom of the abyss where the only direction to go is upward. Rather than launching a perfectly aimed knuckle strike to their windpipe, take a deep breath, pity them for missing a few rungs on the evolutionary ladder, then thank them for the lesson. Three, never show up at a poker game with money you cannot afford to lose. If you bring $100 to the table, prepare to make the other players collectively $100 richer. Consider it the entry fee for a fun time with good friends. Never dig into your pocket for your car keys or propose that the winner of the next hand gets to spend a night with your wife. She just might do it. Number four, you dog people know you must always patrol your yard with a shovel and plastic bag before the family shows up for the barbecue. Most times there's little doubt about what needs to be picked up. But every now and then you run across a shape of questionable origin and you think to yourself, is it poop, or is it just a clump of dirt, or maybe a smashed pine cone? The wisest course of action is to pick it up anyway, 
then you will not have to worry about someone accidentally treading on it later and tracking it through your kitchen and across your living room carpet. Consider this the most important metaphor for life. If it looks like poop, assume it is indeed poop. <laughs> number five, you can assess a person's worthiness of your friendship by the number of times he or she shows up to help you move. <laughs> number six, Never lend money to someone with the assumption of seeing that money or that person ever again. Of course, this can often work in your favor. If you do lend money to someone, consider the transaction merely a donation to a worthy cause. Number seven, never put anything that has hair on it into your mouth. <laughs> that five second rule does not apply if you own a dog or a cat. Number eight, there is not a more fearsome creature on this planet than a teenage girl. Not if, but when the Tralfamadorians land here with the intent of destroying all human beings and ravaging our planet for its remaining natural sources, resources, an army of 14-year-old girls armed with nothing but wads of bubble gum and cell phones can tip-tock those extraterrestrials right back into their flying saucers. <laughs> Number nine. Never readily admit you are related to someone who bears your last name. You might just feel obligated to defend the scumbag if from nothing else your family honor. Whenever the question comes up, you might find it safer to say you are the sole survivor of the 1964 Alsatian genocide. 10. Whenever someone utters the words, no offense, but it means they are about to insult you with the least regard for your feelings for the fact that they are drinking your beer. The best course of action is, interrupt, is to interrupt them mid-sentence by saying, it seems you are about to offend me, so F you first. <laughs> Two honorable mentions. Number 11. If you haven't already done so, invest in some very sexy underwear. Before you can be sexy, you need to feel sexy. And number 12. If you have the will to do so, you can always squeeze one more brush full of toothpaste out of the tube. Okay. Thanks for listening. Okay. Our next reader is going to be CL. C.L. Lidikhev is a poetry and propagandist who poet and propagandist who lives in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, with his real name, wife, and children. He attended most of his life in the southern part of New Jersey. His work has been published in places such as Humana Obscura, Red Fez, McQueen's, Hairs, Paul. Hare's Paw, and River of Heron Review, amongst others. His poem, November Snow, Philadelphia Children's Hospital, is a finalist for the 2021 Best of the Net Award. Please join me in welcoming CL. Why I wore this the whole time, I have no idea. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. I have two different tools from you. I have a 14 year old daughter, so this is a good, good follow up. For, is that right? The Greg right. Fox. I was remember Fox. It's easier that way. Um, so, just a quick background. So, I had to give my daughter a bone marrow transplant right before COVID. So, I was doing the whole mask, hiding in a house long before any of you were. So, um, so this one's called Chemo and Feathers. She did not know I had to poison her life, and my life is never the same as the soft snow like tears, ash on the ground of Verdun, the still point of history now draining into her blood-empty veins. No gas mask, no saline, she becomes an open bombardment, planned assault as I slept on plastic benches and dream of worse battles, of mustached men around maps, instead of med charts, each artillery volley built into chemo shells, radiation, 
Visions persist of Mary Curie jamming handfuls of gas down my daughter's throat. Cartoon skin bathing the room in green feathers that fall heavy, making her bed rise as she drinks her poison cure. Slowly clearing her marrow, trench by trench, death by death, ready for the real war ahead. Uh, she's fine. She's really fine, everybody. I know. I know it's sad, but she's fine. She's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, this one is called uh, "When My Mother Speaks of the Moon." In the 1970s, I was told birth was a night sky. She tilted her mouth open and became the moon became the vector where talk of rain becomes the announcement over the tin radio in the ceiling. Patient mixed with light and blood, oak floors were swollen into feet, the pollen of thunder pounding lungs as nurses order, and the void of my father. I bloomed inside her, pastels in memory, metal and gears of labor, the snapped twig of my sister. Outside in the waiting room, quote up to that one. As she walked, she left a trail of crowns, tiny constellations of color leading straight into the dark mornings that followed. When my mother speaks of the moon, she speaks of the past. Before I cried for hours, before the living room walls were bleached in yellow smoke, dogs rested in piles on the floor, blankets of fur, before the grace of her life waxed and filled the apartment with its mass. Uh, one more? Maybe one more? Yeah, why not? Okay. We'll read in more chemotherapy once. Those are enough. Um, in the land of Wolf and Owl. Uh, father Wolf gone angry against the mother's bladed hands. Feathers scattered over melted Tupperware. Her voice in mid-owl madness perched on the sofa bed. The blood of every bird carries a different note a different taste in talons. In this season, the water tower and its shadows sit along the trees, dark lock of root, of vine, a place where the secrets talk of an escape plan. I can see it from my window, the torn silver tot finder sticker, fireman's hard immunity, half lost to my own mock scratches. Mother Owl knows only royal and flame, the hooked wing of Cowtown, plates as they climb halfway up the steps and smash. A memory as it coats the exposed edge of the trees, pushes past the angle of the apartment window. I spit up in the corner, an egg, a pellet, a ball made up of fur and pinion, of fear and wound. By morning, it dries into a stone heart. Thank you. Reader will be Catherine Keegan. Now living in rural Bertrandsville, PA, Catherine Keegan's first published poem was in her teens. Her innate need for creative expression led to her performance art, conceptual art and the introduction of, the, of wearable art to the Philadelphia craft show. While working as a studio artist many years ago, she kept journals filled with poetry and kernels of ideas for future poems. For the past 19 years, she was a sustaining member of the Beating House Writing Writers Group. She occasionally leads communal poetry workshops. Her poetry evokes a world of timeless patterns through close observations of nature. Rooted in gratitude and awe, her poems often disclose a spiritual unrest for the human condition and its frailties. Join me in welcoming Catherine. When the pandemic happened, uh, I found it very difficult to write poetry. But at the end of the first year, I decided to face it, and I wrote this poem. A 
Pandemic Poem 2020. Before entering Old Woods, I have learned to pull on high boots. I am not the only sojourner reluctant to leave the canopy of wild things, where my familiar, familiar, familiars show no threat. It is in the ordinary world, in a simple life, where pandemic pearls pound my door, where the death count is the only score of interest, where coping challenges time. In the awe of the unknown, there must be some sense to this scourge, something to attenuate the frailty of human value. Meaning often survives from footprints left behind. Memory covers wounds, buries them safely in an undergrowth of scars and possibilities. In these days of upheaval, I find no comfort, no map to navigate this threat. Unsettled days irritate my soul as I pray for healing and grace. There are times, special times in your life when you have a moment of awe, cracking an egg. I watch the winter sunrise mount the kitchen window. I crack an ordinary egg, exposing yellow deep as that solar core. Circles of gold gild this morning with possibility. In moments like this, large and small lose meaning. How many more suns will raise my days? And of these, how often will I see the birth of morning light? or celebrate an ordinary slice of buttered bread. <clears throat> the end of winter, I am always listening for the song of the frogs, <coughs> spring peepers. In the shadow of black birch, peepers serenade a moon, full and pulling hearts to the sweet, sweet possibilities of spring. Like me, they could not wait. This year it was St. Patty's Day. They trilled their mating songs long into the night. Were they wearing green? <laughs> Willows responding to this lusty chant forced shoots to haze the sandy creek, a run made wild by melting snow. Daffodils' brave souls already display a winter store of gold. How do they know when to start this cycle? Is there a moment, a nanosecond, that brings renewal to recognition? Is it the sun or its shadow that starts this sprint to procreation? Or is it a whisper in the wind? A rhythm basic as a breath calls me to put my belly deep in mud and trill to a moon, full and pulling my heart to the sweet, sweet possibilities of spring. The other phenomena that I really look forward to is the migration of birds. And around my neighborhood, it's grackles. <laughs> grackles, you hear them first, chattering beyond the ridge, and then they come, swooping and swirling as one. Thousands of birds bound together in a shimmer of black lace rippling against a heaven of blue. This dark wave crests the hill, skims treetops, and spills into the valley where glaciers carved a hollow many migrations ago. Like drums on the wind, beating wings vibrate their song of return. Even crickets halt their continuous chant in witness to this annual pilgrimage. For one brief moment, a few select trees droop with the weight of ephemeral fruit. The comings and goings of grackles excite my belief in miracles, stored deep and often forgotten in the ponderings of faith. I 
everybody likes their old shoes, including me. Goodbye, old shoes. You served me well, held steadfast in the tangles. Deep woods did not deter. Your souls and my soul, intractable explorers. We joined in countless journeys, at times on holy ground. Remember how softly we trudged, tramped down the white corridors of cancer, marched miles for causes filled with hope. Step by step, undaunted, we trekked on trodden trails, sometimes made our own. I've worn, your out, I've worn you out, your day is over. You are beyond repair, sadly for me. You will join humanity's debris. I will continue searching for the magic, pace by pace. Thank you. Our next reader is going to be George Retinior. George Wright Noor has written poetry for 46 years. He is a lawyer, is married to an audiologist, Melissa Wright Noor, has two children, is a member of the Royalshire Baptist Church, Odd Fellows, and Andrew, Andrew Posophical Society, and has lived in the Kimberton, Spring City, Parkerford area for most of his life. Join me in welcoming George. I look back for poetry from April of years when I was writing, and I found one from April 21st, 1978, and it's a sonnet like Teresa likes to write. My small, well, I should explain, I'm a, um, my granddad and my dad, and uh, then I worked at the water company in Spring City. Um, my small town, this is called Meter Reader, my small town's residents, all demented, so I have to pay. They say they don't know who's there, knocking door to door, even though I've been there 30 times before and said the same iambic line, good morning, read your water meter, please. I used to go in unannounced, but now it's gotten so I can't get in at all. I met instead by locked up doors, or worse, by crabs, crones, teed off bad with snapping jaws, red marks, and mange. Damned cold, in rain I wait, my book in hand. They ask me if I'm sure I'm there to read. They say they're just afraid that things are changed. I shiver at the door and understand. 1978, that was. Um, found another one in 1979. Um, I was often asked by my Aunt Doris, she was the nurse up at O&J, uh, to say grace at Thanksgiving dinner. And the last time she asked me, uh, I was looking at the table, and just as I was closing my eyes, I saw the jello there vibrating, the green jello, you know, with the fruit cello and my mind went entirely blank and it was just filled with this green cello so I just I just I said something like oh Lord help help this food help this food or something and I was never asked again but I pictured I, I pictured you know Friedrich Nietzsche being at Thanksgiving dinner it says Friedrich darling would you please say grace this is April 27 1979 this sun Grace? Listen, I'll give you grace. Granted the cold, may earth freeze shut so hard that by no might may she break free. Granted heat, may the old world's waters boil away and the hot light blind us. Offer it a gentle hand to hold, reject it, let all war with all. Incite us with hatreds candied, spiced remedies to our malaise. Justice, let it be sold. Demand a truth transcending all our tragedies. 
a truth that yields to no one and that none survives to tell. Forget survival. Seize your right to swap the earth for moon or sun. Escape his works, who'd known not what he'd done. And um, the last, the last, but I, I feel like I'm in um, a time of apocalypse. Uh, I'm not depressed about it, really. It's just, it's just, it's just how it, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, there's social apocalypse where everybody's going into their own world, you know, separating from everyone else. There's environmental apocalypse and there's the, there's war. And uh, so this, this poem is, um, is a, a favorite. Though wave and hollow rock Christ's stricken craft, and gusts of air from everywhere wrestle our sails away, and we see a lee from the parrying mast in the spidery revelation of depths above and before us, no quiet cove beyond this ice-strafed waste will not come about. For we know no ecstasy, no lust, no throw, no passion, be it high or low, to touch the treasure Christ's craft bears across eternity's sunken stairs. Christopher Alden grew up near Detroit. He currently lives in the suburbs of Philadelphia. His work has appeared in Boston, the Boston Literary Magazine, Friday Flash Fiction, Down in the Dirt, and the Westchester Story Slam Anthology. Christopher runs the Mainland Writers Group Critique Workshops and serves on the board of the Mate Brandywine Valley Writers Group. When he's not hammering away on micro and flash fiction, he attempts home improvement projects or takes lessons from his rescue dog on how to be a better human. You can find him on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Alden's Thoughts. Talk again, Chris. All right, testing one, two, three. Oh, there we go. Yeah. We can certainly hear you now. Okay, so you if you if you can all hear me, I'm wondering if you can turn if you can turn the laptop or whatever it is so that we can see the audience. You want to see the audience? Okay, sure. I do. All right, I do. Hang on. Well, at least most of it. <laughs> Evan and all the other readers are great from a side view, but uh, I'd, I'd love to see the audience. Hello, audience. Hello. Um, sorry, I can't, can't be here with you tonight. Um, I will say, if you are feeling like you have allergies, um, 
maybe it's not allergies, so get tested. <laughs> that way you don't have to put everybody else in, uh, in harm's way. Um, and that's kind of what happened to me. Someone thought they had allergies and it turned out to be COVID. Um, Evan, are you, I'm, am I on the clock now? Uh, yeah. yeah, you can start. Yep. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, two pieces that I got for you. One is called Restrong. When I was 12, my mother took guitar lessons. I begged her to teach me, teach me, but she said I had to wait until she learned. Two weeks before my first promised lesson, a drunk plowed his pickup truck broadside into her car, killing her instantly. She had been on her way to a lesson with plans to stop at the music store afterwards and buy me a six string acoustic for Christmas. I became angry at life, at God, at drunks, and at myself. The police recovered mom's guitar from the twisted metal wreck that had once been a car, but I wanted nothing to do with it. If it wasn't for that guitar and lessons, mom would still be alive. Any desire to play died with her. My father added the guitar to a pile of her things to give to charity. Over the ensuing years, I learned to deal with my anger and loss, got married, and had a fine son. One day, while rooting around in my father's basement, he discovered the guitar. I guess we'd never gotten around to giving it away. He picked it up and gave it a few untuned strums. I felt a chill pass over me. He begged me to let him fix it up and learn to play. Tangled up in my memories, I was reluctant, but eventually gave in. We stopped at the music store on the way home and bought some strings and parts. After dinner, I showed him how to replace the strings and tuning pegs. As we finished up and he began tuning the guitar, I caught a strong swirled scent of my mom's perfume and the years on me began to fall away. My son played a few notes, bent into the guitar, and didn't notice a thing. And the second one is called The Burden. I'm near the end, and I've kept my past under lock and key for too many years now, but my recent recurring dream has finally cracked me open. In the dream, I am pushing a wheelbarrow along a road filled with snow, mud, and human excrement. Cramped barracks rise on both sides of the road, dark sentinels above me. The scent of decay cloys the air, sickly sweet and putrid. The pushing is hard, the road forever uphill. My hands are frozen to the wheelbarrow handles. Emaciated shadows wait at the entrances of the barracks. The words, Arbeit Matre, hang above each opening. As I struggle past, the shadows step out one by one into the light. They are wasted, pallid ghosts, left sleeves of their striped, ragged shirts rolled up to reveal their numbers. They carry knives, and with the efficient precision of the camps, they slice their numbers from their forearms, tossing the bloodless, oblong, tattooed strips of flesh into my wheelbarrow. The work goes on and on until my wheelbarrow is so full that I cannot see forward. There is no break, no end, no casting aside of my burden. Upon waking, I feel thin and worn away. My grandson showed up this morning with recorder and notebook in hand. Soon we will dive into the work of never forgetting. And when it's done, he will carry the burden with strength and I will be the free man. I once was in my youth. Thank you.
probably could. I think I got some applause, but I couldn't yes. hear it. Yes, yeah, you, we, we uh, mute ourselves here, but uh, yes, we did get applause. Thank you, Chris. All right. Our next reader is going to be Kathleen Takalowski, who goes by the nickname CAC, a sociolinguist and professor of Spanish in central Pennsylvania. She likes to write about she likes to write short and very short fiction and fictional memoir. Join me in welcoming TAC. was born out of a conversation that I had with my mother that I misunderstood. Sarah Kelly knew her daughter's goal with this visit was to get as many of her worldly possessions into the thrift store pile as possible. Her daughter was by now weary of her long stories and detours, but as Sarah held the locket in her hand, she couldn't help herself. A young woman gave this to me to express her gratitude to me for helping her through a very difficult time. Do you remember what specifically you did for her? Kendra asked. Oh yes, I remember. She clutched the locket in one hand, held her walker with the other, as she sat to catch her breath before struggling with the spherical fastener. A glance at the keepsake behind the miniature oval door transported her to a former time and place. 1961, Cole Regional Hospital, a three-story T-shaped brick building in her hometown of Nicomash, Pennsylvania. Suddenly, Sarah stood at a bedside, crisp in her white dress, cinched at the waist, sheer stockings, and soft polished shoes. Her auburn locks tucked neatly under her white cap, a halo in held in place by exactly one white bobby pin. She gazed into the young but world-worn face of a patient, nine weeks pregnant, who'd been admitted for abdominal pain and bleeding. Her eyes, chips of anthracite, were studying the ceiling. Sarah, one semester away from graduating from nursing school, was doing one of her last rounds, OBGYN. When she arrived on her shift, Dr. Halp was staring down at the gurney that passed for a bed in the un underfunded regional hospital. When he spoke, only his mouth moved. We'll keep you overnight for observation, but I assure you that you and your baby are going to be fine. He patted her arm and moved along. Had it not been for the black curls that formed an oval around her head, the pallid face of Angela Byrne would have been one with the pillow. As the doctor walk up, walked away, Angela took a sharp breath and swallowed the news. Sarah took a step in and reached gently for her hand, noticing that the sliver of silver on her fourth finger was loose. I can't have this baby, said Angela, closing her eyes. I already have six children. My husband lost his job in the mines. Sarah nodded, taking it all in. A month or so prior, just before lights out, the girls on the hall had gathered to study and share stories of their experiences from their rounds. Sarah loved to talk about peds, about the joy she got from being with children. That night, the topic of how to terminate a pregnancy had come up. Marcy, with her modern haircut and off-duty red lipstick, was knowledgeable about things of which Sarah knew nothing. She said that she knew of some doctors who were offering safe, if very illegal, procedures. Sarah had paid careful attention, curious, but remained silent. Now holding this weary, overburdened mother's hand, she vowed to try to help. Angela gave Sarah her phone number, asking her to call at a certain time in the evening when her husband would surely be at his perch at the corner bar, managing his own troubles. That evening, Sarah found her way to Marcy's room and broached the topic. 
Are you pregnant? Marcy wanted to know. No, I'm asking for a patient. Sarah's reply was so hasty that she was not sure that Marcy believed her. But she slipped her the information coupled with a very stern warning to be extremely cautious. Even though the clock was ticking for Angela, it took Sarah two more days to call her. Angela, this is Sarah, the nurse from, yes, yes, she whispered, shouted. I've been waiting for your call. Angela asked Sarah to meet her in the local grocery store the next afternoon. Sarah slipped the paper to Angela as she reached for a potato. Will, will you go with me? She muttered so softly, Sarah thought she was directing her query at the produce. Sarah was stunned. She thought this would be the end of her relationship with Angela. Sarah rested her hand on Angela's forearm and nodded. I'll call you in two days. She couldn't sleep that night. Could she jeopardize her nursing license before she even got it? Marcy! Sarah tried to make her voice sound calm when Marcy opened the door to her room at 7 a.m. But frantic nerves pushed the words out of her mouth. She wants me to go with her. Marcy studied <coughs> Sarah's face. Who wants you to go where? The patient. Uh, Marcy finally got it. Uh, okay, so go with her. Just like that? What about the consequences? Look, Sarah, if this lady had anyone else to turn to, do you think she'd be asking you? Marcy wasn't one to mince words. Do you want to go and support her, or do you want to spend the rest of your life wishing that you had? Angela Byrne made all the arrangements. Sarah met her at the appointed place and time. She held her hand and soothed her soul. She stayed until Angela was able to walk out on her own. It was about a year later, and Angela found her way to where Sarah was working her first real job. I'm sorry to barge in unannounced. I just want you to know that I haven't forgotten your kindness, and I never will. As she grabbed Sarah's hand to say goodbye, she passed over a locket into which she had pressed a four-leaf clover. I'm lucky, she said, lucky to have met you. Thank you. From that period of Sarah's life, her friend Marcy's words have rung in her ears over the decades. Don't breathe a word to anyone. And she never had until now. Our next reader is going to be Luke Russell. Okay. Luke Russell, a member of the Meeting House Writers Group, is a Westerner transplanted to Philadelphia where he was taught in the English Department at the Community College of Philadelphia for some 40 odd years and where he credits his successes with inner city students to their appreciating and responding well to the mythical traditions of the classical Greeks and the Igbo of West Africa. Some of his modern mentors are Yeats, Hopkins, and Keats. Join me in welcoming Luke. Hello. Can, can you hear Luke? Can you hear me all right, friend? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Louder? Okay. You want it louder? No. No, you're good. We're good. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead. No, I'm. I'm we're, I think we're, you're mute, we're muted, so but we can hear you, and you sound great. <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay. I've asked Marjorie, my wife, to read a slight introductory sketch, and then I'll present the poem. This poem, in the style of a Robert Browning dramatic monologue honors people in Luke's family from the 1860s and later to the 2000s. It references how small farms all through the Midwest are going belly up and the farmers are selling off their spreads and moving into towns in the big cities. Check out the search heading farm auction if you are so inclined. Photographs showing the sellers are likely. Sometimes the effect is haunting. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. The lady in this photograph is about the age that my mom would be, that Luke's mother would be. The stove she is next to is the same wood-burning kitchen that he grew up with in the bleak 
windswept Arizona of the early 1940s. The detail of the old woman's grandfather, who got out of the Civil War by shooting off a toe, is also a true story, as is the detail that afterwards he would lash out at his grandkids with a leather strap. Shiloh was a place along the Tennessee River where the Confederates caught the Union Army eating breakfast, and a three-day battle ensued with shockingly high casualty rates on both sides. Shiloh. Yesterday the photographers was here all day. They wasn't taking pictures of all the stuff he loved. I don't know half of what's here. Potters, wooden wheels, tin watering cans, hatchets, candle molds. A lot from before the war, the Great War, I would say. The bad one after Aught Nine. Fellas and older boys are going off to France. Many not coming back. Lots with the chlorine gas. No wind a coughing blood. Yep. Well, anyway, what he'd buy with anything well made. Built good with his words. Porcelain dolls with beautiful faces. Bodies made of socks. Big stuff too, monstrous old equipment. Tractors from when John Deere was still called Waterloo, yep. Had his funeral yesterday and now everything has been photographed and is going up for auction. The field and the house too. Airplane did that, up over here to take a picture. And the auctioneer was here all day yesterday to take a picture too, yep. Even took a picture of me in my Sunday apron sitting by the stove. She's a real honey, I'll tell you, this stove is. Sad to see her go. Best pies and venison you ever had. Six ton of hay give her, give for her back before the war, yep. The great war, mom would say. She's still cooking, yep. Can't take her to the new place, though. No chores there. No cooking in Shiloh. Strange name of the place, but that's what they call it, Shiloh. And someone else will be doing all the cooking. I'll miss that for sure. Over at Shiloh, I'll be sitting probably. Maybe reading. Maybe some puzzles. We'll see, yep. Damn letter said Leroy's wife isn't working on her pectorals, whatever that is. Never could understand her, nor what Leroy was a seeing in her. Didn't care about the farm. All he wanted was to live over in town, sell shoes and be with her. Yes. That marrying, you know, that marrying is a funny thing. You want to marry, so you, you don't matter who it is, you marry whoever has, whoever it is, that's all you have. Take mama. Never saying a word all those years when grandpa was a, a lashing at us kids with his stroke. Thick old leather. Even at her and mama sometimes. But neither never saying a word, no. He was so bitter, always lashing out at us kids. Shot on his big toes so as he could come home. Hated the war. Not the Great War, no, no. The Civil War, 60 years earlier. Hobbled around. Always a raging at us kids and making noise. If he caught us, he'd build us real bad, yep. About the war, he'd say Grant was a genius. Told over and over how Grant and his corps come up the river in a steamboat, in steamboats, to where men, maybe a thousand men, was a hiding under the riverbank, trying to get away from the fighting up top. Grant's aide right then started shouting and ordered about, round them men up and shoot them for desertion. Grant spoke up right quick and said, no, no, leave, leave these men be, they'll be back a fight tomorrow. And sure enough, we would, he'd say, yep. Yep, have to have someone take into town all this food the neighbors bring in, bring in after the funeral. So much. Don't eat hardly nothing, he'd say. Better give it away to people over in town anyway. No room for it in the new place. Two rooms, no stairs, no chores neither, just a sitting. Maybe reading. Maybe doing puzzles. 
Maybe thinking about all those soldiers a cowering down in the mud in the water so long ago in Shiloh. Thank you. Thank you. reader is Christine Emmer. Christine writes across the genres. She is an actress, director, writer, and educator who finds joy in many landscapes. Presently, she is involved in the publication of her novel, Dreaming of Storms. She finished a film last summer of her one-woman play, From Out of the Fiery Furnace, for Friends of Hopewell National Park. Look for her in poetry journals and on Amazon. Please join me in welcoming Christine. I have to do this the old-fashioned way without the mic, so bear with me. Discovery. The old chest held between my fingers was unlocked, just as though it were waiting to open to my touch, there on the shelf in the attic of the old house that breathed in and out in ghostly respiration. So how could I be misled? It was mine to interpret. This casket that burned the edges of my being with invisible flame, only when bounty is found and recognized for what it is, then it becomes treasure. The lifting of the lid was easy, not so easy, to understand the contents within. The writing on the paper was far, and the gentle bird's egg crumbling under my touch. Only the sepia photo gave me a clue. A handsome face staring directly into the lens, unsmiling, to remind me I might be intruding. Whomever left it sitting there foresaw this moment of challenge. Would I judge the contents as trash or treasure? Now there was a folded handkerchief under the photograph, linen and faded, so carefully placed there. I was dizzy with the scent of lavender, and then came the coin spilling out on the floor around me, dazzling me with a smile of real fortune. I knew they were not coins I used to feed my life, but something foreign as the figurines on the paper. And again, the ghosts around me sighed, the raspy sigh, and it seemed that they settled on boxes awaiting my estimate of what I was unraveling. The tears long dried on the journal at the bottom. This suddenly watered my present moment and a cry from another galaxy funneled down to rouse me. Here was thing someone sought to preserve past their own time because they treasured it an old casket filled up with things time itself could not contain. Well, there were petals of a flower dried there, a flower that had been touched by other hands and then closed up in a letter from long ago to whomever, to myself who found it. I asked the ghosts about me, but they, they did not speak. Perhaps I was the one who should explain. I wanted to know what we value from our own histories. I wanted to know why we are touched by such tiny gifts as a, a fragile bird egg, a, a handful of coins, a neatly folded handkerchief caught in the smell of lavender, or, or the photograph of someone who stares out of the picture in even-eyed honesty. The note left behind might have explained it to me, but I never could find anyone who could read it. I 
took the chest with me when I went downstairs, uh, hugging it tightly as though the ghosts might do battle to wrench it from me, and the day moved off to make room for the night. I poured whiskey before the fire, and again the ghosts followed me, filling up the lonely house, and the ghosts began to speak in the voice of the whiskey. They asked me, what would I leave with my treasures? when I left life, and they circled me, and they prodded me as shadows in the night, and at last I smiled. Our curiosity itself is the greatest treasure, causing us to ask further, seek further than the mere flesh we came clothed in. Memory is the deposit where we store the experience of value the first kiss, the sudden thunderstorm in summer, a, a painting hanging on our wall, a voice speaking out the darkest hour, a street in Paris where we walk, the face of the person we hated most, loved most, touches against the fur of animals who slept at our feet. We hope to fill the casket before we leave to become a watching ghost. Treasure buried is treasure lost. We pray another will find our gold. We pray they will count its great worth. Thank you. I'm not going to drive in this. I'm not going to in anybody. <laughs> Our final speaker will be Rich Wilhelm. Rich Wilhelm is the news editor in the communications department at ASTM International. He is also a writer and a tour guide at Laura Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. In the latest incarnation of his online journal, The Dichotomy of the Dog, Rich has challenged himself to write and publish exactly 217 words every day. Rich lives in Phoenix with his wife Donna and son Chris. Please, welcome. Please join me in welcoming Rich. Thank you all. Uh, this has been a really great evening. So, each one of these pieces is exactly 217 words long. <laughs> if you're interested, I can direct you to my website and you can read these each day. This, one, this first one is called, Gordon Lightfoot is Walking Among Us. I could tell when I drove into downtown Phoenixville to pick up our Taco Tuesday dinner that last evening was not a typical weeknight. Traffic was a bit heavier, and my easy parking spots couldn't be found. At first, I didn't know the cause of this excitement, but then I remembered. Gordon Lightfoot is walking among us. Lightfoot, the renowned Canadian troubadour, responsible for, if you could read my mind, Sundown and the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, is playing the Colonial Theater last night and tonight. The Lightfootian celebratory electricity on Bridge Street was palpable. Sure, I'm being somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but only somewhat. I very much enjoy Lightfoot's classics, and I understand why Bob Dylan rates Gord highly as a songwriter. Of course, for me, there is also that level of actually remembering when Lightfoot hits were saturating AM radio in the 1970s. Think about this. If you could read my mind, Sundown, Carefree Highway, and Edmund Fitzgerald are substantial, sturdy songs that all also happen to be top ten pop hits. Their titles intoned by Casey Kasem. The sultry Sundown, in a room where you do what you don't confess, indeed, even spent a week at number one. Enjoy your stay here in Phoenixville, Gordon Lightfoot, until the carefree highway carries you down the line. This one is called Everything, Everybody Eating Tonight. 
I have known for years that I share my first and last names with Richard Wilhelm, the German sinologist who translated the I Ching, the Book of Changes, from Chinese into German. Since last October, I have received several voicemails from Author Reputation Press, LLC. In these messages, I'm told that ARP can help me market my book, I Ching, by setting up radio <coughs> interviews and bookshop placements, among other services. No one at ARP has done the research that would reveal that the I Ching is a classic book of philosophy that has existed for thousands of years, and that its German translator, who is not me, has been dead for 93 years and no longer has any need for publicity. Here's the crazy thing. Richard Wilhelm's work influenced his friend Carl Jung's thinking, which includes his theory of synchronicity. Jung's synchronicity led to the police's synchronicity, which led me to Jung's synchronicity. <laughs> Jung's synchronicity maybe even played a role in Repo Man's plate of shrimp scene. That scene illustrates the power of the lattice of coincidence, which is one of the guiding principles of my creative life. So the fact that there are people out there who think that I am the Richard Wilhelm who translated the I Ching is one crazy plate of shrimp. <laughs> this is called By Jove, Mr. Bispam, that was bully. Once in a while you are presented with a once in a lifetime opportunity to do a certain thing. When that happens, you need to do it if it's a thing you want to do. Last October 2nd, I had the opportunity to talk about American opera singer David Bispam while standing at his gravesite in Philadelphia's Laurel Hill Cemetery on the 100th anniversary of Bispam's death, which exactly coincided with what would have been my mother's 79th birthday. I did this moments after I completed a 5K dressed as Willie Nelson, in mom's memory, at Laurel Hill. David Bispam is the star of nearly every tour I lead at Laurel Hill but this was the only time I could do this on his death centennial, slash the 79th anniversary of mom's birth. Weird to think that Bispam had only been dead for 21 years the day mom was born. I could not let the opportunity slip through my hands, so I led a group of 5K participants to Bispam's grave and told them the story of how Bispam sang his hit song, Danny Deaver, for Teddy Roosevelt, much to Lady Rose, First Lady Roosevelt's chagrin in the White House. By Jove, as Teddy himself said, it was bully. On the plate of shrimp scale, this was a five shrimp out of five life experience. I have one more. I wrote this one yesterday. Uh, this is yesterday's entry, and it's called We Don't Love Enough. I'll be honest, for a former altar boy, I am a fairly secular guy these days, though I do love gospel music. I spent this Easter morning listening to The Time for Peace is Now, gospel music about us, a compilation of obscure 1970s era soul songs rooted in gospel. The music and message of the mighty staple singers looms large over the artists and songs on this 2019 compilation. The entire collection was perfect for today, but the title of one particular song stood out. We Don't Love Enough by The Triumphs. The straightforward message is captured well in the title. Indeed, we don't love enough. Thinking back, I am fortunate to have received much love, particularly over the last week. This love came in forms and from sources, both familiar and surprising. During a week in which I was attempting to process the first anniversary of Mom's passing, all of this love, even if I did not recognize it as such in the moment, was comforting to me. Now, whether I've been loving enough, I'm not certain. And it's not a question I've thought about much, at least not in the broader sense beyond loving the people closest to me. But paying forward the love I've received is something I need to think about and act on. Thank you.
you everyone for participating in the 2022 Spring Open Mic Night here at Hoopin' and Soul Library.